then it was not no, it was no longer a case of Palestine and its liberation. A wide wall was created in the south of Europe, extending up to Eastern Europe by the Ottomans. And unless Europe West could break that wall, they could not penetrate beyond. So from then on, it was not just a Muslim war or a Christian war, a war which had got turned into a much wider perspective, fought over a much wider canvas of human history. There, it was not the south which was threatened this time, it was the east of Europe which was threatened. And Bosnia is a direct child of that problem. So I think I have spoken enough of the background because you're all learned people, you understand what I sp I'm speaking about. So there is a much bigger and much deeper history of mutual distrust between the Christian world and the Muslim world. That distrust is basically not religious, but political. As long as there was polarization between the West and the Eastern European Empire of Russia, that these issues were subdued, were of lesser importance. Now that there is no more that polarization, the West considers it its prime responsibility to recreate the wall between the Western value, the Western way of life, and the possible future threat from Islam. Now, unfortunately, this situation is further made complex by the attitude of the Muslims themselves. Quite right. <laughs> Madhudi being in the forefront, the Khomeinis are another, uh, you know, figure of the same <coughs> phenomenon behind. Just the faces change, but the principles do not. The same threat emanates from Libya, from other sources in the Muslim world. And these threats are in fact hurting the cause of Islam far more than they are hurting the cause of Christian world or even potentially they can ever hurt the cause of Christianity. They know it better than anybody else. There are threats in the name of Islam as they raise their head. These heads of the snakes <coughs> begin to bite the very Muslim powers who nurture them. The very interest of the soils on which they are raised fight between Muslims of Egypt and the Muslims of Egypt, the fight between Muslims of Algeria, Muslims of Algeria, Muslim of Afghanistan, Muslim of Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. So the Western people fully realize that in reality there is no potent threat. But to muster the common forces of Europe against a possible threat of Islam, the material is already provided to them by the Muslims' own stupid behavior. Why not utilize it? You know, for the sake of the future rainy day. And that is exactly what they are doing. It. They are doing. We are fighting against big odds. Am I these? When we raise the voice in defense of Islam and draw their attention to the real factors responsible for all this, the reference to the real history, they know well. They themselves reject us in the name that you are small thing, you are not Muslims. And there they quote the non Ahmadi Muslim scholars who in fact are responsible for creating threats against them. They take sides with them. So in the final analysis it is just diplomacy and politics which you see, not a real religious confrontation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, a very small question. Uh, my name is Tariq and I'm from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Yes. Uh, I just want to ask when you plan to come to Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj or Umrah? You see, the, the Hajj and Umrah issue 
again is deeply rooted in Muslim history itself. Yeah. It's not for the first time that uh, those, Mus those who claim to be the Muslims and the true Muslims for that matter were prevented from performing Umrah and Hajj. You know when it started? It started at the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Read Surah Al-Fatha and you will find it mentioned there and discussed in other hadith. The first man we know in the history of Islam who was prevented from forcibly for performing Umrah and Hajj was Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah himself, the founder of Islam and his followers. But what was the answer to that problem? That must remain the same answer valid for today. The answer was that as against the advice of his own followers who had united against Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu interpretation at that time. That is the only time in the history of the companion of the Holy Prophet that they dared to oppose the understanding of the Quran of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu because they were overwhelmed by, by emotion. Only temporarily. God forgave them. Mentioned that in, the, in Surah Fatah. And what was the issue? Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu understood from the teachings of the Quran that Umrah and Hajj are only compulsory when the conditions are met, prerequisites are met. And one of those prerequisites is peace of the passage and safety. When you are opposed by force not to perform, you must return back to your homes and not perform Hajj. So this is the principal answer which I give to your question. But again, this question is uh, perhaps uh, not based on the exact facts. Yeah. Saudi Arabians themselves are not against Amadis performing Hajj. Their reaction is always in response to some Muslim countries where hostility against Amadis has reached a point of madness. It, were, it is always to pacify these countries that the Saudi Arab government refuses visa to certain embassies. But from Africa, we don't notice any such thing. There the attitudes of the governments are different, so also, correspondingly, the attitude of the, British, of the Saudi government is different and more benign towards the embassies seeking to go to Hajj. In Europe, I know one embassy from England who happened to be friendly to the then ambassador of Saudi Arabia and he said, why don't you perform Hajj? Be my guest. He said, you prevent us. He said, no, no, forget about that. Come and fill your form and don't even mention what you are. I'll grant you visa and you'll be my guest. So he went to Hajj and performed Hajj there. So that's what I mean. The attitude of the Saudi government is not that uh, stupid and uh, nonsensical as that of some other Muslim countries who somehow impose this attitude on their decision. Thank you. Thank you. And that should be all for today. Now we are left with, uh, well, the, normally we say our Zuhar prayer, the midday prayer at one o'clock. Already we have passed 33 minutes. But I'm happy, very happy because the guests who were invited today, whether they participated or did not, they were so kind and so much interested throughout. They did not sign, show any sign of restiveness, to my knowledge at least. And uh, the meeting you and to sit with you, to share your time, was the most wonderful, rewarding experience for which I express my deep gratitude to one and all. Allah bless you. Thank you. God bless.